Today's episode is brought to you by the University of Hawaii College of Tropical Ag and Human Resources and the Livestock Extension Group. Aloha and welcome to the Livestock Valaau, a podcast aimed to provide educational support, information, guidance, and outreach to livestock stakeholders in Hawaii. We are your hosts, Mele Oshiro and Shannon Sand. Today, we're going to discuss herd health and biosecurity. To do that, we're going to introduce you to an amazing person and the veterinarian for UH, Dr. Janae Odani. Dr. Janae Odani grew up in Wailuku, Maui, and is a graduate of the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. She is board certified veterinary anatomic pathologist with experience working with a variety of animal species. So with that intro, Janae, tell us a little bit about how you came to be the veterinarian for the University of Hawaii. Okay, so it's um, kind of a long story that winds around, um, but you know, uh, believe it or not, I went to vet school initially to become a feline practitioner because I, I love cats and I just wanted to play with cats all day. Um, but when you go to vet school, they expose you to all the animal species. And um, that's where I learned that I actually really liked working with fish. Um, some of that might come from, you know, growing up in Hawaii, my dad was a fisherman. So, you know, just spent a lot of time, you know, in the ocean, looking at fish. Um, and I, I, anyway, I was just really attracted to it. Um, so uh, in vet school, at least at UC Davis, they allow you to select a track for your fourth year. So, you know, like a lot of people might pick small animal track, right. food animal track, large animal track, um, different things, but they were they were kind enough to let me design my own track. Oh. So I ended up calling it something like fish health and herd health. And it was <laughs> basically a lot of fish health rotations, um, a lot of pathology thrown into that. And um, I, I did a bunch of large animal rotations because that was the herd health component of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I I got kind of drawn into private small animal practice just because the money was really good. It was supposed to just be a summer job, but then mm-hmm. I ended up staying for a couple of years. But I kind of quickly realized that it wasn't what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So I went back to school and I did a residency in anatomic pathology. And uh, I worked in a diagnostic laboratory that focused on livestock and poultry. Oh, and, so you, you know, I did that for- you weren't a cat lady after all. So. Yeah, no, I, I was not the cat lady, but I did have like my crazy cat clients on the side. That was kind of like the side hustle. <laughs> we but, all need those. We all need those. Right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, it's funny, I even picked up like a crazy rabbit lady. So yeah, there's all kinds. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <Nice>. <sighs> But yeah, so, you know, it, it was all, I mean, it was just really fun. I got to do a lot of really interesting work. I, I loved being a pathologist, you know, working, um, well, working on dead animals and, you know, just trying to answer a lot of the questions, you know, whether it's disease related, sometimes it was forensics related, but, you know, no matter what, it was always just super interesting. But I, I did want to move back home eventually. So I, um, I was lucky enough that there was a job that opened up at a good time in my life. Mm-hmm. And I... Um, moved back at the end of 2006 for a job with the Hawaii Department of Agriculture in the veterinary laboratory. Nice. Yeah. And, um, you know, in the vet lab, it, you know, it, it was a bunch of lab work, but it was pathology work and, you know, dead animals are owned by somebody. So yeah. I actually yeah. spent a lot of time. Yeah. I spent a lot of time talking to producers and, you know, consulting with, you know, maybe their veterinarians and, you know, we were doing troubleshooting. So that was really fun, you know, more, probably more engaging than just the straight lab work. Mm -hmm. And around that time too, maybe like a year or two later, the University of Hawaii needed a a animal diseases uh, lecturer for one of their courses. And so I did that for them. And then a couple of years after that, they needed someone to teach anatomy. So I did that and I, I just realized I've been teaching anatomy here for 10 years. Um, but it wasn't until 2016 that the extension vet position, you know, in CTAR opened up and I applied for it and I was, you know, really lucky um, to get it. It's kind of a no brainer position for me because it's, you know, it's everything that I like. Um, there's all this outreach that I get to do with producers. Um, there's enough farm stuff. There's lab stuff. I get to do the instruction with the students, you know, which is really um, rewarding. Yeah. And yeah. So anyway, I, I call this like, seriously, my dream job. I love it. Oh, nice. Yeah. So you're in, uh, I guess, tell us more, a little bit more about the animal science program there, because you do work a lot with the pre-vet students. And um, that's one of the things I think you know, a lot of 
students here look for is some advice for those that want to go into a veterinarian career. What can you, what kind of advice can you provide or suggest to those, those okay, kids so thinking I guess, about it? <laughs> yeah, so here the shameless plug is they should become animal sciences majors. If you want to go to vet school, be an animal sciences major. Um, but, the, but the real answer is you can major in whatever you want if you want to be a vet. Mm -hmm. Like my roommate in vet school, she was a piano major. <laughs> yeah like for real she was a well, piano major so and um, I I've heard that like so when I was in like undergrad and grad school like at, at the University of Florida I was like I, I had a lot of people that were aiming for vet school and like I have heard it's harder to get into vet school than medical school because there are mm -hmm. much fewer like vet medicine like universities or schools or colleges whatever words today <laughs> I was like yeah. But then there are actual like medical schools, like you're much more likely to get into medical school than vet school. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's a numbers game. Um, and there is a shortage of vets. So the profession oh. knows that. Yeah. I mean, like everybody's scrambling, um, like, especially right now in COVID times, you know, because we're having trouble having people um, traveling. So we're not getting all the relief vets that we need coming mm -hmm. to the islands. Yeah, it's, it's really rough. And, and it's a national problem. So it's not like, you know, there's an abundance of here. yeah it's not like we can just yeah. like bring them from somewhere else like everybody's everybody's struggling so um it's interesting they they know that there's a problem where there weren't enough veterinarians being graduated each year to meet the need so there are um several new schools that opened up like you know Arizona now there's one in Long Island um oh, you know yeah. a, bunch, a bunch of different new schools are opening up but it's still pretty selective yeah, uh, but but I think it's mostly, um, you know, they they need to be able to handle the math and science courses. So, you know, if I'm talking to kids in high school or younger, you know, I, I tell them, like, do good in math and science. Like, that's that's like the main thing. Your only job right now is just learn math <laughs> and science. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, um, you know, and then and then truly they can major in whatever they want because the vet schools only care about. Uh, what prerequisite courses you took. So even if you're a mm -hmm. piano major, if you took biology, organic chemistry, biochemistry, you know, a handful of others, you, you can still apply. They don't, they don't care what your background is. Um, but then they also want to make sure that you have a, a good understanding of what the profession is like. Because, you know, like I told you, I wanted to be a cat vet and I wanted to play with cute cats all day and kiss them. <laughs> yes, totally wouldn't? not what practice is like. <laughs> yeah, Nella's laughing, right? Yeah. Like, that's, that's not what it's like. No ways. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it, you're not going to have every, you know, I, I spent many years as a vet tech prior to being with UH and you're not going to have every cat in that comes into the office that's going to want to be cuddled and pet. You know, a lot of them will just kind of swat you in the face if you try to get too close. So. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, I when Janae was um, applying, I remember I, I went to your seminar and whatnot when you were here in Waimea. So I remember you coming in for the application as an extension vet. And I remember seeing all your stuff and I went, oh, she's like, it's like CSI for the animals. She's like a forensic scientist is what it is, you know, looking yeah. at all those diseases and stuff. So that was really, really cool. Yeah, yeah. a little bit. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, there, there's just so much to learn about diseases. And, you know, like I said, um, I do try to help people out um, if they have legal cases or, you know, like criminal cases even. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So That's seeing cool. all of the diseases and viruses that impact livestock and animals here in Hawaii must be important. Yeah, there, I mean, the diseases that we see here in Hawaii um, are, you know, pretty similar to what we see elsewhere in the United States, mm -hmm. but there are some I don't know, maybe things that are just emphasized more or we have to manage them differently here in Hawaii. Like Mele and I are kind of working on a mm -hmm. on a parasitology project. Oh, and that's exciting. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, I think it's super exciting. The, the worms yeah. are pretty cute, right? Under the microscope. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we grow them up from little eggs. We hatch them. We love them. Yeah. <laughs> but we um, nurture them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, so in Hawaii, we have this tropical climate. So, yeah. you know, the, the animals, you know, get exposed to the parasites, they poop them out, maybe in larger numbers. In yeah. the mainland, if they have like a good frost, a lot of those guys Still will do. die. Yeah. yeah. But we don't have that here. So I do think that we just tend to build up higher loads. Yeah. And our animals have to adapt to it, or they get sick and, you know, they might die. Yeah. 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 Parasites is such a huge, huge topic. And I think one day we'll have Janae back to talk about those kinds of things because it is such a huge thing in small roommates and you can spend a lot of time talking about it but 
there's all so many different strategies I think producers can use um, in regards to improving um, their herd health. So, uh, you know, is there anything more that I guess we, we talk about, you know, herd health and whatnot? So Janae, you wanna, I guess, expand a little bit about herd health here in Livestock in Hawaii? Yeah, so I, I talk about herd health a lot um, to my students, you know, especially because we have to kind of move away from treating the one sick animal. Um, we have to think about treating the whole herd. Yeah, think, mm-hmm. think bigger picture. And, you know, so it kind of always, I feel like you, you need to have a plan so that you know what you're doing at every you know, step of the way, at every stage of the animal or the production cycle. You, you kind of need to know what your goals are. Because some people are trying to crank out the maximum amount of production that they can. And, and other people, um, you know, they're just happy if they don't lose money while they're doing it. Right. And, right. and, and, you know, and, and there's different goals, right? It's like some people, it's, it's, it's really business. So they want that, that production of whatever commodity it is. Yeah. And then you're trying others, to like maximize your profit or you yeah. like maximizing the quality of the, like, if it's, a, if it's a, like a, a meat animal, I would say meat or like, even like dairy. Cause I know there's a few dairy. Yeah. Ex- and like sheep, sheep, sheep that are used for dairy and stuff here. So. Yeah. So there, yeah, there's all kinds of, I mean, that, that's the thing. Herd health. I mean, here in Hawaii, we raise like everything from beef cattle yeah, yeah. to, to like shrimp and you know, like, yeah, all I mean, honey bees. like it's there's... so vast. It's a huge topic. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> but, but there are, I mean, I, I would say, yeah, I, like a lot of common elements, but I do think, you know, like that's kind of the first question is like, well, what, what are you, what are their what are goals? goals? Yeah, because, you know, then, then we kind of run into other things where some people are like, no, I need to do it completely natural. I can't use these kinds of treatments or these kind of interventions. So, yeah. you know, those so are if things. if it's organic, it makes it makes a difference in their herd health plan too then, right? Because Yeah, for sure. Use, mm-hmm. Exactly. Separate and like. I'm thinking yeah, no, definitely. Organic. And then sometimes, you know, even thinking about who they're marketing to, right? Because right. then there's a whole bunch of other things that have to go into the plan that, you know, you might not have to deal with. So, right. yeah, so, so they have to, you know, like really understand that. And, you know, most of our, you know, large commercial producers, I mean, they, they know what they're doing. But I do think like some with some newer, smaller scale producers, they haven't really thought about that. You know, mm-hmm. like what really are their priorities? Um, because, you know, you, you might not be able to have it all. Right. right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because herd, you know, herd size, I guess to say, right, is another big thing. And exactly what you're saying, the smaller producers their goals may be completely different from what somebody has. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Makes it, makes it yeah. And, and along those lines, I mean, uh, like the difference maybe between a herd health program, if you've got just a few animals versus, you know, large scale production, um, there's, there's things that we might recommend to, you know, a large producer that's cost effective for them. That exactly. would make zero sense for a smaller Producer. It's not nearly cost right. effective because they don't have those economies of scale or size. Exactly. Scale the, exactly. Like I understand yeah. that part. Are you the part. economist, Shannon? I would have never guessed. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, those things, I get that. I understand. That. I get on investment. <laughs> exactly right, and I guess that's a good way to look at it, right? Creating a well planned out herd health management plan is an investment. You know, it is a big investment to your herd, whether you have five animals or 500 animals so yeah and the other way to look at it is I I mean herd health programs you know herd health management programs or whatever but really it's preventive you know management um so you know and this is like yeah the economy thing it's like the cost of a vaccine versus the cost of a dead animal right yeah, exactly, exactly. so yeah well all kinds of things to an consider island and it's I feel like it's whole different like it's additional impact because I think Mele's got chickens <laughs> and Mele was vaccinating her chickens or deworming them. I forget which one. And like, she was vaccinating them. yes. Yeah. So I was like, and like, she was, she was ordering the, the vaccine and like, Mele, you can talk more about it than I can, but oh. like just the cost of getting it here. It was, it was the cost. And wasn't it like a 10,000 dose bottle or something? Exactly. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. Exactly. <laughs> right. And then they don't, you know, you don't, you, you got 20 birds or something like that, but the dose is in the thousands and you have to, that's the only way you really get it. Right. Yeah. And then you pay, you pay uh, probably three or four times the amount just to ship it here than it costs for the actual vial that you're yeah. using. So, and you know, it's limited and, shelf life. That's the other exactly. thing, you know, exactly. especially. Yeah. So, so one of the things that I've kind of always wished for was, you know, if we could 
well, maybe not we, but you know, if the producer groups could set up like a hui where like a co-op somebody, yeah, like bring, yeah, like a co-op, like you know, yeah. you guys plan it. We'll we'll all <laughs> vaccinate kind of around the same time. We'll buy the bottle, we'll split it up, and then that way nothing goes to waste. Yeah, I mean it'd be mm. nice. So I, yeah, I wonder that's... if there aren't like neighbors that just already do that to some extent. I think that they are. Yeah. 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 yeah I'm sure it would just right? makes so much sense to do it that way, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because well, honestly, I do that with the cat vaccines. I buy like the whole Smart. tray and I give it my, you know, like I, I but I only have two yeah. cats. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, you you're know, then I'll do the, the neighbors. You're not at the threshold for cat No, <laughs> where like, I need yeah. the whole tray, right? But yeah, but then I'll do the neighbors and, you know, like, yeah. you know, like, yeah. I just let whoever I know I've got like, hey, I've got 14 doses left, you know, who wants them? Yeah. 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 yeah we've done that with dog vaccines and stuff like that before, you know, and just kind of split it up. So yeah, yeah makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. do what you got to do. Yeah. So it sounds like herd health plays a really big role in ensuring the long-term wellness of our animals overall. Janae is shaking her head. Yes. For those that are listening. Oh, okay. I'm like, am I yeah. supposed to say some things? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, for sure. For sure it does. And, um, I, I just think that if people have a well, you know, thought out plan, um, it, it will really just help them down the road. We can avoid a lot of problems. So, you know, there's so much more people moving and visiting here now in Hawaii. I think, you know, Hawaii has kind of become like the safe zone with COVID and stuff. It really has. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, and we, oh, you know, we continuously getting more invasive, you know, invasive species is always an important thing, but then we also think about biosecurity, right? And how does that um, relate then now back to our herd health and management plans that people can build, you know, how does biosecurity play into that? Yeah. So, you know, agritourism is a big deal, right? Huge. Huge. Yeah. And from a biosecurity point of view, I, I cringe. <laughs> I can <laughs> imagine know? because teaching someone to decontaminate before you yeah. go to visit the, I'm just going to say again, I'm because we're livestock. I'm just going to say the goats, the pigs or the chickens, and then like decontaminate before you leave. Because if you go somewhere else's to someone else's farm, you might exactly. be taking someone, something with you. It is a, it is a, concern I would imagine so yeah and and then again it goes back to well what are your goals because if your goals yeah. are sh strictly production yeah. you're you're not going to deal with that kind of stuff you're just yeah. going to be like no no visitors you know closed completely um but there are ways to you know kind of mitigate the risk so we'll talk about you know like disinfection protocols mm. um training for personnel and you know there are just certain activities that are really high risk versus others you know, uh, like, uh, I'm just thinking for like the pigs, right? We, we cook the garbage that we feed them, but you need mm -hmm. to specifically tell people like, do not feed the pigs any meat products, especially those that come from other countries, you know? And um, I, I just think that kind of, you know, education will, will go far. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of cute. I mean, like even for me, um, maybe, and this should make my producers, you know, feel better. When I go to the mainland and I travel, I actually bring a little pouch of dried Vercon mm -hmm. and I disinfect all my stuff because I don't want to walk. Like I just imagine like I'm walking around this building with all these other people and I don't know where their boots have been. <laughs> and I don't want to like walk around and walk around my hotel room, yeah. you know, like that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. It's not just what you're going to bring back, but then you're going to take it back to your hotel room. Yeah. It's like, ah, yeah, I don't need that in there. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, I guess so that's some of the key things, right? I mean, if somebody can just um, realize, I mean, one of the key things that they can change in their, in their farm to ensure that their biosecurity, what would you, what would you tell them? If they said, well, we don't have money to do this whole biosecurity plan. What's the simplest thing we can do? What would you tell them today? You know, I, I guess, so, so we need to have like, kind of like a fencing and just an idea of what we're going to call like our protected zone, you mm -hmm. know, like what, what's in that mm -hmm. safety zone. And then um, knowing that just try to keep um, a lid on what goes through it, mm -hmm. you know, things that people can do that really doesn't cost anything. It's just having clothes that are farm specific. Mm -hmm. So in other oh. words, clothes that don't leave the farm. So like just a pair of boots that are always there, you mm -hmm. know, a pair of coveralls or whatever that are always there. And mm -hmm. those things just never go to another farm. They never go to the feed store. They never go anywhere That's else. Smart. Right. And then, um, you know, for like, we, we recommend this a lot to the, the swine producers who maybe do on farm sales. We tell them, you know, if the client, if the customer wants to, you know, like look around the pens and pick the one they want, you just have extra pairs of boots for them. 
and right. that you know that, that's pretty inexpensive right so just you you know so just to be aware of like what are the highest risk activities and do what you can to mitigate those mm -hmm. that makes sense that's a good point yeah oh and then yeah, the those... other thing oh i'm sorry no, go well, ahead. Go ahead. Just kind of going back to uh, maybe more of the herd health aspect, though. One thing that I would really recommend to you know all producers is um, keeping really good records, mm -hmm. and with that comes animal identification because we want to be able to say like that animal over there, how old is it? Where did you get it from? Did she, you know, like how how many kids did she have last year? Mm -hmm, right. right. Um, th things like that. You know, we we want to just have really good records so we're not guessing. Yeah, right, right. That's really important. Yeah, record keeping is one of the key things. And then when you have a, a break in your little chain or whatnot of command, you know, or things you know that have crossed over, you know where it came from and whatnot. Yeah, exactly. And so simple yeah. things like, well, when you opened the new bag of feed, right? Exactly. When you gave the vaccine, you know, things like that, just if it's written yeah. down, it makes things a lot easier. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like this whole contract or contact tracing that they do with COVID, right? It's yeah. the same thing. It's like, we almost have to remember like where we've been, and whatnot. So somebody says, you know, you kind of don't really think about it, but now you've got to think about a little bit more where you're going and who you're yeah. seeing. And yeah, no, for sure. And actually, um, I mean, with biosecurity, you know, the people who have the tight plans, that's one of the things that we ask is like, you need to have a visitor log because you need yes. to know who came. And that way, if something happened, then, mm -hmm. you know, that's documents that you can either turn over to whoever's investigating or, you know, just call them up yourself and say like, hey, yeah, <laughs> this yeah. happened and you should yeah. watch out, right? Yeah. yeah. So you a must be of... busy all the time. Uh, I mean, with all the different things I do, I am, but yeah, I mean, everybody's busy. Everybody's busy. That's awesome, Janae. How are you able to accomplish so much? Coffee, tea, Mountain Dew? Uh, yeah, basically the Diet Mountain Dew. <laughs> yeah, the, I call it the beverage of champions. I, I can't live without it. And there's honest to God, a shortage on Oahu. Really? Sam's Club and Costco are both out. I And oh, I'm cheap. Okay. I'm not going to pay, you know, like target prices for it, so. And we recycle Janae's Mountain Dew bottles, I must tell you, because we keep, we, I kept them and she's, she's kept them for me, actually, um, for our parasite and larvae project. Oh, <laughs> good. Well, isn't it adorable, right? We're going to grow our little baby worms in my Mountain Dew bottle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they'll be moving so quickly across that screen. We're not going to be able to see them, no. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So. Oh, well. So we want to uh, say thanks to Janae. Uh, make sure you to join our Facebook page, the UH Livestock Extension Group. If you haven't already, visit the UH CPAR Extension website and Livestock uh, Extension Group YouTube channel that will have uh, listed in the show notes. For additional information about this topic, see Janae's website listed in the show notes of the podcast and the description box of our YouTube page. Thanks for listening to the Livestock Vala Owl. Uh, and before we go, everyone, make sure you show some love for the, your favorite podcast by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or one of those platforms I use. Uh, and stay tuned for next month's episode where we'll be talking with Dr. Mark Thorne. So mahalo, everyone. Mahalo. For tuning in. Thank you very much, Janae, for being here with us today. Yes, thank oh, you. Thanks for having uh, me. Yeah. yeah. And off we hope to we talk to you again. Bye.